There's the second part of a video on Dreamcast games. You can go ahead and watch this part first or don't. I, I don't I don't really care. It doesn't matter for this video. Sweet mother of terror, that cover art. This is the kind of thing that would have absolutely given me nightmares if I saw it in Blockbuster as a kid. Ill Bleed is a um cult classic? Is there a term more obscure than cult classic? And my point is that I've heard of this game a handful of times before now, and it's all been positive, but fuck if I know anything about the actual game. And a quick search reveals there's really nothing much about it on YouTube other than a handful of playthroughs and reviews with even less of an audience than me. Looks like I'm gonna have to be going further in depth with this game than I did with the last three, because unlike Neo Centipede or Pen Pen, <laughs> you aren't gonna be getting your hands on this one. Ill Bleed is a Dreamcast exclusive survival horror game released literal days before the Dreamcast discontinuation in Japan, and a few days after that in North America. Interestingly, it was released the following year in China, which doesn't seem like a big deal, but it's apparently the only Dreamcast game at the time to have a separate Chinese version with its own translation and everything. I have no clue why this is the game they chose. Illbleed was created by small-time studio Crazy Games, a tragically short-lived studio that we'll talk about more at the end. Let's jump straight into the game. We open on a high school speech contest where our purple-haired heroine, Eriko Christie, is giving a presentation about her screwed-up childhood. Her father was obsessed with all manner of spooks, creating tons of traps and scares and testing them on his young daughter, traumatizing her and snapping her mind, leaving her in a state where Eriko can't truly feel any form of fear. Eventually, Eriko's mother did divorce her husband, and Eriko was freed from his experiments. Likely in an attempt to find that part of her that can be scared again, Eriko has grown up to have a love for horror media, even though you'd think it would be the opposite. After her presentation, Eriko is greeted by her three best friends and fellow horror aficionados, Kevin Kurtzman, Randy Fairbanks, and Michelle Waters. No, I did not misspell Michelle, that is how it is spelled in-game. So they, uh, hold the phone- what the hell is this? Why don't their faces move? That was great! I mean, you're the head of the horror research club and- President of the student council! It's a given! This is something that passed on the PS1, where the characters' faces were just featureless facsimiles of a human visage. But Illbleed's characters look good for the system. They have entirely visible and defined faces. So it's kind of fucking distracting when they don't so much as blink while speaking. Back on topic, Eriko's buddies are itching to go to a giant haunted house park crafted by enigmatic master of frights, Michael Reynolds. If you already called the twist, congratulations. The name of this petrifying wonderland? Illbleed. It, to be upfront, Illbleed is more or less a murder factory masquerading as an amusement park. We're later told over a hundred people die here a day, but nobody seems to care to stop them for some reason. And don't get hung up on that fact, because it will never be explained. That might make you wonder why anyone would even go to a place like Illbleed. And that's because if anyone is able to survive all six haunted attractions, they'll be rewarded... <laughs> 100 million dollars. No, I don't know where the money comes from or where the authorities are. Eriko is the only member of this group that isn't too dumb to live and immediately points out how absurd of an idea it is that there's a haunted house that would give out a hundred million dollars. Obviously, something fishy is clearly going on here, but her friends decide to go anyway, leaving behind Eriko's ticket as they leave. Unsurprisingly, the game cuts to three days later, and Kevin, Randy, and Michelle are missing, having never returned from Illbleed. With no real choice left, Eriko, with her nerves of steel, heads straight to the park to find out what's become of her friends. Oh, jeez, let's, let's pull that back. That's much better. That's pretty cool, actually. Survival horror games back then were pretty notorious for weird slash terrible cameras. So a game that allows four different styles of distance and movement for the camera that can be changed depending on the situation is great. So with our vision adjusted, we... What the hell is that sound? That's the music we're going with? Did I misread what this game is? 
the name, the viciously detailed gore, the M rating. I wasn't expecting chill circus music. The song isn't bad, it's actually super catchy, but it did throw me off and began my confusion over what kind of tone the game is going for. Furthering my confusion is the hub world. It's very stylized and exaggerated, more carnival and less wacky haunted house. But the comparison, a haunted house, it turns out is rather apropos, because that's precisely what playing Ill Bleed is. It's a haunted house simulator, both literally and figuratively. That's fine though, I'm not against oddball B-movie horror, that could still be fun. It isn't what I was really looking for, but my expectations adjusted, it's time to really dive into this thing. Each attraction is presented as a movie theater, each playing their own film inspired by scary movie tropes that sets up the backstory for the stage. We head for the first one, The Home Run, Home Run of, of Death, Death, which details the tragic tale of the Bonbolo family, Gale and his son Jimmy, or Gale. Fuck, I probably should have checked that before I started recording. Uh, there's no accent above the E, so let's just go with Gale. Jimmy was a baseball prodigy who practiced day in and day out with his father, using a special underground field Gale built underneath the hotel he owned. On a fateful spring day, while father and son were practicing in the basement, a group of teenagers messing with fire burned the entire bomb below in to the ground, killing Jimmy and brutally maiming and disfiguring Gale. Having lost his dear son, a vengeful Mr. Bomb below procured an industrial blowtorch and wildly murdered the kids responsible for Jimmy's death, becoming a furious, mutilated monster that pursues and kills anyone who dares approach his son's final resting place. Yeah, they put a good amount of thought into these setups. They really established the mood for each section of Illbleed, and most could easily be real movie premises. Well, let's just take a few steps forward. I'm sure that nothing- this is a terrible omen of things to come. I have no idea what was even happening on my first attempt at playing this game. Every single object and passage jump scared and damaged my character. Boards, doors, phones, fucking haunted soda cans. At the end of the first hallway, I was already basically dead when a huge burly meat man popped out and my character had a heart attack and died. What is going on here? What are all these meters? H? What the crap is that? What am I supposed to be doing? Uh, clearly I'm screwing up something here. I eventually figured out that the tutorial is off to the side behind a building. You know where your absolutely vital tutorials go. Looking at these signs, it would appear we have to use the horror monitor by pressing A when all of our senses are maxed out, then press R to look around. When the horror monitor is in use, we can see hidden items and the triggers for shock events. We can mark those things by spending some adrenaline, but we can get it back by investigating the blue light. Okay, that's good, that's good. Uh, one small problem. What? What are you talking about? What horror monitor? This, this thing? Shock events, the, the jump scares? And what items? There's, there's nothing here. There's like five different meters on the screen. Nothing happens when you press R. It's just first person mode. It, maybe it doesn't work in the hub. I went back to the first level and dicked around for a few minutes, but nothing happens no matter what I press. What is this game? Okay. I had to resort to the power of the internet to discover that the horror monitor is not an innate part of your character, and it's not this meter up here, you know, that's monitoring things, and is in reality a pair of night vision-esque goggles you have to find and pick up in each stage. That's what this first tutorial box is trying to tell me, but the English is so fucking mangled that I had no idea. I concealed the horror monitor where you stand now. All of your four senses on screen are the proof of the item. When the sensors reach their peak, press the A button to obtain the horror monitor. It's saying that you have to find the invisible horror monitor in each level by watching for all four of your senses to perk up at the same time, which means the monitor is nearby. Then you kind of blindly mash A and walk around until you find it. Like I kind of tried to say before, the only way to avoid all of these invisible randomized traps, called shock events, is to use the horror monitor to identify them, which costs adrenaline, this blue brain meter on the bottom left. Failure to identify shock events will cause your heart rate to spike. If your pulse gets too fast, you'll pass out and be left vulnerable for a few seconds. And if you keep pushing beyond that point, you'll die of a heart attack. You can warn yourself that an area is suspicious so that when approached, your character won't be scared or harmed by the shock event. Doing this successfully will actually restore some of the adrenaline you spent to mark it in the first place. 
This has the unintended consequence of making the game less interesting if you're good at it. There are hundreds, probably, of completely animated shock events and scares, but if you're playing even remotely competently, you won't see the vast majority of them. But not all shock events are harmless frights. Let me take a moment to say how relieved I was when I triggered my first battle. If you watch my streams, you know that I cannot stand 90% of survival horror games with no defensive measures. They quickly turn into yawn-inducing games of hide-and-seek in large, dark, empty rooms that usually rely on your fear of being caught and presumably jump-scared, rather than focusing on other, more interesting forms of engaging the player, like story, sound, world, and creature design. This is an incredibly roundabout way of me saying, I like that Illbleed has a combat system, and I think the game is better for it, even if it isn't very rough. Robust. No, no combat controls are given, imagine my surprise. You can melee attack with X, which performs a multi-hit combo. This uses your bare hands until you pick up the stage's melee weapon, at which point it automatically becomes your new attack. You can't guard, but you can dodge in any direction by pressing A, though you're not getting much distance out of it. It beats nothing, though. I found it much more useful to just run around and wait for an opening, rather than constantly engaging and trying to dodge every attack. Your character has two health bars, so to speak. Their stamina, which functions as your usual HP that goes down with damage, and their bleed meter. Taking damage almost always makes you bleed, and when this meter overtakes the white marker here, you'll begin to take passive stamina damage from blood loss. If this gauge ever fills all the way, you'll bleed out instantly and die no matter how much health you have left. You can staunch the bleeding with items, but if you don't have any available, you can always... stand around and wait for the bleeding to stop. Oh, looky there! I tutorialed so long, we're at the end of the attraction. The first one's pretty straightforward, so there wasn't much to discuss. Eriko finds the practice diamond in the hotel basement, and places Jimmy's missing trophy and commendation we found in their proper places. Do not forget to pick these up on your way down. Number three, first base, Jimmy! Okay, no. Here we go! Oh, sweet Jesus, what the fuck is wrong with him? I thought he got burned! Why does he have a giant festering beehive head? Oh, for fucks, can I just know what to do for 10 minutes, please? The mutated hotel owner can't be killed, it seems. I must have hit him 50 times with no results, and there isn't anything around the room to interact with, other than one of those landing pads. I figured that they're used to run from battle. There's even this waving down animation if you press B. But I didn't realize until basically the end of the game that you're meant to mash B as fast as possible to make the ladder drop. I thought its falling speed was in line with the waving for help animation, so I would only press it to trigger the animation and then wait to press it again, and that took forever. Once you do run, Mr. Bombolo vanishes into the ether, and you run into the next room, a confusing series of hallways where Meltman and his flamethrower pop up at every turn. And I do mean pop up, he will literally teleport around the maze, making keeping track of his position almost impossible, it's quite nerve-wracking. Near the end of the labyrinth, we see him drag one of our friends away and follow him into a boiler room, and even though nothing has changed, we can hurt him now. I love arbitrary shit like this. We beat him up and the boiler explodes, sending Bombolo reeling away. Wasn't this fucking movie about baseball? We've reached yet another impasse here. You can't hurt the giant mutant whatever 
you have to run through the water, but he tracks you real hard with his swings, and even if you have full health, too many hits and all this running will make you die from blood loss. This section is how I discovered that the dodge, despite being little more than a short sidestep, has tons of invincibility frames, allowing you to just phase through his arms. Here we find a control room with some random asshole fiddling with levers. Eriko begs for his help, only for him to reveal that the gigantic freak is an incredibly expensive animatronic. This is an amusement park after all. Hell, he's the one who's been operating it this whole time. This does not sit well with Eriko. Every stage in Illbleed has a base prize pool, with a series of clear conditions that require your stats to be below or above a certain threshold. For each parameter that doesn't match up, you'll have money deducted from your total clear reward. Oh, right, money. We should talk about that now. Might as well talk about all the buildings in the midway while we're here. There's the Dummy Man Photo Studio, which is a save point, much like the photo booths that are contained within the levels themselves. Bloody Mary's, a convenience store that sells all of the game's different restoratives, the regular ones anyway. Be careful when you buy things here. The game doesn't tell you this, but your inventory is entirely cleared when you finish a level, so there's no such thing as saving items for later. I would still recommend you buy a ton of supplies from here though before each stage. The first level kind of spoils you with items, but the amount you can find in the stages gets lower and lower. There's the visitor bank, which allows you to purchase your friends for a steep cost if you fail to save them within a stage. Like, 70% of all the money in the game steep for a single character. And lastly, the ER, where you can spend money to heal yourself, revive dead characters, and most vitally, use the body part jars you can collect around the park to give yourself stat increases. These only apply to the specific character who undergoes the surgery, so the game sorta of disincentivizes using multiple characters. Rather, you should just make a single stupidly strong one, and it should be Eriko. You might think it's still worth it to have multiple characters ready for like a backup, but not really. Yes, if a character dies, you can then switch out for another without reloading your save. But that new character spawns at your last save location anyway, so you might as well just reload your save. Alright. Finally figured everything out. It took way too much effort and time, but I do like the game's structure. I like the idea of the horror monitor. I've got the combat sorted out. Let's go, second theater. Revenge, Revenge of the Worm Queen. I lied to you. The horror monitor and shock events aren't Illbleed's primary gimmick. This is. By this, I mean the sudden change in the gameplay formula. That standard, search the area and carefully advance structure is gone now. It's replaced with some other horror trope in each level, even if its skeletal framework does still remain throughout. Don't let my cadence mislead you. I like this, and I can admire attempts at shaking things up over relying on one stale idea. Checking the horror monitor and nothing else for six levels would lose its novelty fast. All that to say, Attack of the Worm Bitch is boring. The whole area is nothing but empty dirt roads. There are no shock events in the entire attraction and very few items. The lore of this movie is that people have taken to eating worms rather than meat, and the largest farmer of said worms has gone insane and died, leaving his worms to attack the townspeople, all headed up by the queen worm he named Rachel. What does a monkey with drip have to do with any of that? You tell me. Tremors, this is not, but it does take its basic concept. Overgrown, violent worms will burrow out of the ground if you're standing on bare dirt, but they can't follow you onto the asphalt. Fighting the worms sucks. They spend most of their time underground, only barely popping up for a hit or two before disappearing. Uh, don't start bleeding either. This place is simplistic, but there's a ton of running in straight lines required to avoid the worms, leaving me to stand still for an unacceptable amount of time so I don't bleed out half my health bar just by walking around. 
anyway, we figure out we'll have to use fire to kill the giant queen worm. All we have to do to get to it is perform the worst parkour line imaginable with this piddly ass jump. If you fall onto the dirt, Rachel attacks you, and just like Bombolo at first, she's immortal. But escaping still sends you back to the start of the platforming section. Much frustrated, careful hopping later, we reach the fuel for a flamethrower that gives us the firepower we need to defeat Rachel. I've missed you so. It amazes me that there were reviewers at the time that couldn't tell this game was one big ironic shit post about old horror movies and mistook it as the game just being bad. The developers are clearly in on the joke here, guys. <laughs> Third stage, coming up next. Wood Puppets. The setup for this world is that a guy named McLaughlin, obsessed with making his woodcutting business better, made a super schwick chainsaw and tried to use it to cut down an ancient tree. The tree then ate him. Years later, workers at the lumber mill began receiving mysterious boxes containing violent living wooden dolls that inexplicably bled when damaged. I start the level, get ambushed by two crash test dummies, hit by a car, and immediately reloaded my save to start over. There really isn't jack shit you can do in combat without a weapon, and the dummy men are too fast for you to slowly inch down the ladder. That's fine though, because the horror monitor has been returned to us, and we're back to looking at things until they stop being scary. Now that it's back though, I kinda wish it wasn't. Back in the first level, there was one or two shock events that didn't seem to have any indication, even when using the horror monitor. I just chalked it up as a glitch. But the entire first half of this attraction is filled with events that don't trigger the detection meters, that they don't show up on the horror monitor, or they overlap each other so that the same location jumps you multiple times in a row. It's so odd. I didn't have this issue in any of the levels before or after this. It sucks, but it doesn't matter much because Wood Puppet has another gimmick that shows up before long. After exploring a bit, you end up at a large conveyor machine. The machine used to turn human beings into wooden dolls, it seems. So, of course... Why, you stupid fuck! Look at you now! As a newly formed wooden doll, we're slightly slower and cannot jump. The game then drops us into a battle royale obstacle course with a bunch of lumberjacks, with winning the game being the only way to turn back to normal. So the level is almost entirely combat based, with you fighting off a dozen or so woodsmen for the majority of the time. You've lost your weapon, and instead your only method of fighting back is to hit a really stanky leg. This is unironically the best weapon in the entire game, because it hits multiple times and you can move during the attack animation. However, be aware that all these battle ignitions drive up your heart rate something fierce, and I had to stop a few times just to wait for it to go back down. And keep in mind when I say that, that I'm playing as Eriko, who has the slowest possible heart rate increase by default. I don't know how the other characters wouldn't constantly be dying of heart attacks if their pulse is raising way faster than hers. Right near the end of our woody excursion, we can save our friend Randy, who's been turned into a puppet to be experimented on. After fighting off the doctors, you give him back his brain that you found in a bin earlier. Though, the internet tells me you can simply not do that, and he'll spend the rest of the game a drooling idiot with no adrenaline meter, who mindlessly babbles during cutscenes. You turn back to normal thanks to an Iron Maiden I was almost certain was going to murder my ass, chop up the aforementioned giant tree face eater thing, and I guess that solves the problem because we proceed to nope the fuck out straight away. Theater number four. Killer department store. Very easy premise here. Some rich bastard named Donald Cashman owns this giant mall and in an attempt to drive up sales is preparing a Black Friday deal of such scale that it will make stabbing somebody for a Wii look tame in comparison. People die, mall is abandoned, time to dead rising this bitch. 
As soon as the attraction begins, we're given the entire potential prize pool of $150,000, rather than receiving it at the end of the level. But aside from that, Killer Department Store is the closest to normal gameplay we've had since level 1. The rub is that the shock events here can drain your money, and if you don't have enough cashola left by a certain point, you'll be screwed, as one of the doors has a mandatory minimum. But the department store is pretty normal besides that. Normal for Illbleed. There's a lot of visual variety here. There's the main entrance area, the produce section, which is taken over by the worms. A barbecue joint where you have to fight off angry chicken carcasses. I will not elaborate. A toy section, which has some cute references to past Sega consoles, among other things. Oh, turns out Illbleed has guns? In a secret office near the elevator, I found a friggin' SMG on a fireplace, along with some hidden money. It doesn't do as much damage as melee attacks, but in a game where movement is so stiff, it's great to have a ranged option. The second half of the stage is a series of encounters with Mary, a possessed doll and owner of the creepy face on the cover. She forces you to participate in three challenges that mostly end with you blowing her brains out when she loses. Arriving at Cashman's vault, yeah, yeah it, invincible boss, uh, I'm leaving, I'm leaving. Eriko happens upon another animatronic control bay, swiping the remote out from under the staff's nose and using it to make old Cashman bash his own skull in. Cashman's on fire! Hey, you! I'm gonna pull down the ladder! You gotta get out of here! Quick! Theater 5 Killer Man! Getting some serious death gun vibes here. This area features a murder mystery in the back rooms of the park. The staff of Illbleed are being killed by a huge Pepsi Man parody, funnily enough named Killer Man. We team up with our new friend, Detective George, spelled like his parents hated him, to discover what's going on, which you are actually meant to deduce. At some point, the stage asks you which character you think is behind the Killer Man case, and you'll get extra money if you guess right. The first 10 minutes or so of this section are normal, patrolling Illbleed's storage facility full of props from the previous attractions, which is cool. But this gives way to a, I'm not joking, half hour long jaunt through empty hallways and a comically huge body disposal facility. Barely any shock events or anything. I cannot emphasize to you just how long and absolutely featureless this part is, especially for a first time player. We can find a shotgun in this place, but I assume it was added as a joke, because the only enemies that appear afterwards are hordes of zombies, which as far as my testing has revealed, can't be killed no matter what what percentage of their body becomes lead? You do reach Killer Man at the end of the corpse storage. He teleports behind you a bunch. It's nothing personnel. And you finally get to use your shotgun. Final attraction. Toy Hunter. Court goes to hell. This one... I, I, um... Let me try. Uh... We play as Woody from Toy Story, rocking the fastest trigger finger in the West, who breaks out of Alcatraz with the help of Buzz Lightyear. He then wanders the city streets, shooting faceless hookers, warps away to hell in a coffin with a dead kid inside of it. Then Sonic the Hedgehog shows up as the final boss, and you have to shoot all of his rings to kill him before the staff argue over a coding error in the actual game, which lets Woody rescue his girlfriend, a doll named Sexy Doll with the biggest fucking booty you've ever seen, and then they fly away on mentally challenged Buzz Lightyear and live happily ever after. So, with all of the attractions cleared, the path to Michael Reynolds' museum at the peak of Illbleed swings open. We're congratulated for surviving the park, and are allowed to challenge the final test for the $100 million. In a move I don't think I've ever seen before, Reynolds gives you a choice of three different final bosses to throw down with. A real battle against Cashman, the Bull Stinger, which is some large mutated bug dude, and... <laughs> oh no, man. Whoever you pick, it doesn't matter. All of them take way too long to die anyway. I even tried other characters to see if they were stronger or something, but it, it just isn't noticeable. How are you supposed to beat them with your bare hands? Friendly reminder, you can't open the menu in combat, so items are a no-go here. You'll be waiting a long time to whittle down their health bars, but you could get it done eventually. Or you can try for a half hour before realizing these random designs by the entrance are meant to be lockers and are full of weapons. You should probably do that and just shoot the poor fuckers to death. That's way easier. You beat the boss of your choice, 
Reynolds gives you the $100 million, tells you to fuck off. At which point you'll receive one of two endings, depending on how you did. And they're both pretty straightforward. The bad ending is basically not an ending at all. If any of Eriko's friends didn't survive ill bleed, including George, who she just met, you'll hear an elderly Eriko talking about how none of the money brought her happiness because her friends are dead, as the game slowly zooms in on ill bleed's graveyard. In obvious contrast, to get the good ending, all of Eriko's friends and George have to be saved, which is harder than you would suspect. Not because saving Eriko's friends is challenging, but as usual, the game doesn't impart vital information onto the player. Kevin and Randy are almost impossible to miss. The game draws direct attention to them, and as long as you reach them in the allotted time, you'll be fine. George is carted away during the Killer Man stage, with no explanation of what happened to him. I figured he was kidnapped by the boss or something and would appear later in the stage. Yeah, he doesn't, it turns out. He's probably somewhere in the godforsaken corpse room, but I spent 25 minutes just going through there normally. Sorry, George, I don't have that kind of patience. You're fucked. But what about the green-haired girl, Michelle? Which level the other characters were in was obviously indicated with cutscenes along the main path. Michelle was never even mentioned. Where the hell was she? According to the visitor bank, she died all the way back in the second level? Fucking where? I played this stage twice due to a recording error, and I had no clue she was even in the attraction, let alone where she was being held. I would have saved the money to just resurrect her had I known, but I never went to the visitor bank because I didn't think anybody was missing. I googled it. She's in the garage at the end of the stage. You know, the goal. You can't enter via the regular door, something I did try to do before. No, no, no. You have to open up the big steel garage door to get inside, then go on a monkey murder spree to rescue her. Look, I'm not saying it's impossible for someone to have figured this junk out on their own, but the game is simply really, really bad at clearly conveying vital information. The art of teaching the player how to play your game isn't an easy balance to get down, I understand that. Nothing about Illbleed's structure or mechanics are conventional, which is great, but that means said structure mechanics need to be properly and straightforwardly detailed to the player. A simple text pop-up once in a while would suffice. Text pop-ups that are correctly translated and not located in some random corner of the map, to be precise. It is understandable, though. This was Crazy Games' second ever project, and I'm sure with time and refinement, they could have ironed out these basic mistakes. I regret to inform you they never got that chance. It was planned for Illbleed to have an enhanced port onto the Xbox, but the tragically early passing of Illbleed's designer and writer, Shinya Nishigaki, in 2004, put a halt to the project, and his studio Crazy Games dissolved soon after. It's a shame. I would have liked to see more titles from him and his team, especially since Illbleed ends on a severe cliffhanger. Oh, yeah, uh, it turns out there's actually a third ending I didn't mention, only available in New Game Plus. If you play through the game again with your enhanced stats and don't save any of Eriko's friends, which I guess is meant to tie into the good ending, where she returns to the park alone, you'll receive the true ending. I'm going back to Illbleed. What? 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 Okay. I need to explain this best I can, because showing it to you extensively is not something I plan on doing. Every time you don't save one of Eriko's friends in New Game Plus, her clothes become more torn. And this effect stacks. So in order to see the true ending, Eriko will have to be basically naked. Now this is not to be a prude, absolutely fucking ridiculous looking, but that's not all. Let's look at her ID and, uh, yep, that's a, that's a six, that's... <laughs> That's a lower number than I would like it to be. Then, when you reach the final boss again, and I need you to avoid screaming into your hands when I say this, Michael Reynolds gets so excited, he decides to come down and meet us directly. He then unveils the swerve that I'm sure even you guys managed to figure out despite not playing the game. Reynolds is Eriko's horror designer dead. Oh, it makes that scene from five seconds ago a lot creepier. He waxes on about his reason for creating Illbleed, apparently doing so to make Eriko afraid once more. How does he plan on making Eriko feel true fear? Oh! Yeah, that might do it. Eriko defeats her dad, but is still broken by her traumatic experiences at Illbleed, and is once again able to feel true fear. I can't believe it. You actually destroyed yourself. You finally did it. You scared the living hell out of me.
The new president of the Horror Research Club will now be me, Kevin Kurtzman, due to the fact that our old president, Erico, is just not the same anymore. Poor Erico. Once fearless and strong, she turned into a vulnerable little girl who needs a fearless knight in shining armor to protect her. Like me. Yeah. And the sad part is, I can't go to the horror house with her anymore. And that's Ill Bleed, a fun if flawed black comedy horror adventure with an eternally unfinished story. The concept and atmosphere is top notch. The gameplay ideas are there for sure, but it's not very clear about its basic mechanics. One of the levels is dull and another is intolerable, which really bites when your game only has six levels. Still, I desperately wish this game got its Xbox port, or was it at least more accessible and would get ported to something? Hell, I don't even know who, if anybody, owns Ill Bleed these days, so I don't know who we'd have to ask for, say, a Steam port. People love this kind of ironic, scary movie crap these days. I'm sure it'd do fine. Alas, I am not quite at the relevance level where I influence video game re-releases, so you'll probably just have to hope somebody more successful than me covers the game, and maybe that'll generate some interest. So, is that it? Were these videos building to some larger point about the Dreamcast? About the reasons for its death, or the tragic way hundreds of thousands of work hours and passionate designers' hopes and dreams can be erased by something as simple as poor timing in an ever-changing technical landscape? No. No, not really. I just wanted to laugh at the penguin guy doing the poggers face. Look at that guy. Battle Network 6 is the next video. Late June, early July. Thank you for watching. Patrons, you're awesome. I love you. You guys are great. I'm tired. I have much, much work to do. Farewell.